Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, howdy. howdy! Well, good morning, FaithBridge. I hope that all is well. It's great to be back with you for a second week in a row. My name is Timothy Atik, and I'm the director of Breakaway Ministries in College Station, and I always love the opportunity to be here at FaithBridge. I want to start just by telling you something that I experienced several years ago. I was in Israel, and my cousin and I took a day trip to the Dead Sea, and as we sat there at the Dead Sea, we just decided to people watch because it's a great place to watch people. And uh, as we were people watching, we saw people doing what you normally do when you go to the Dead Sea. There's two things that people really like to do when they go to the Dead Sea. The first thing that people like to do is they like to just float on top of the water. Uh, The Dead Sea is about nine times saltier than the ocean. It's hard for anything to live in the Dead Sea, so dead things tend to float. And so living people can go and experience what you would be doing if you were dead at the Dead Sea. And so people just like to go and float, and it takes no effort. The second thing that people like to do is they like to pick up mud off of the bottom of the floor of the Dead Sea, and they like to rub it all over their bodies, and then take a walk up to the freshwater showers and clean off because they think that it's therapeutic to the skin. And so on this particular day, My cousin and I, we were watching this group of people who were doing the mud thing. They were reaching down and they were just caking their bodies from head to toe in mud. And these people were very ambitious. We believe it was their goal to cover every single microscopic component of their skin. And so they got every single bit of their arms, every single bit of their legs, and then they made their way up to the neck. They covered their neck, and then it moved up to their face, and they were very intricate, getting right under the eyes and the nose and all over their forehead. And all along the way, they're laughing and joking and pointing at each other, having an incredible time. At some point, They realized, okay, you know, this has been enjoyable, but now it's time for us to take that walk up uh, to the freshwater showers and pull the little string so the water come on and uh, we can get cleaned off. And so we are watching them make this walk, and, and as they are walking, they're laughing and they're joking and they're pointing and they're high fiving. And it's all great until they get to the showers. Because as they step up to the shower and pull that cord, nothing happens. (laughs) And excitement turned to panic. And so they begin to feverishly pull that cord. Nothing. The only thing that would have made it better for me is a bucket of popcorn because this was one of the most entertaining things that I've ever seen. You see these people in this moment where what was enjoyable became uncomfortable. This thing that was a source of pleasure became a source of displeasure, discontent, and anxiety. And you could see it in their faces. All they wanted in that moment was to get clean. And the reason I tell you that this morning is because I just wonder if that story is in some ways our story at different times in life. You know, when we use the phrase getting clean in our society, what we're talking about is breaking free from something that is no longer desirable in your life. Like when people uh, get out of rehab, what they will say is, I've gotten clean or I have been clean for this period of time. What we are talking about is coming to a place in your life where you realize that something is no longer giving you life, but it's stealing life from you. And so you you want to begin to get away from or break free from the thing that is no longer giving you life but 
stealing it. So see, we as people can begin to cake ourselves in different sins of this world. We can cake ourselves in the sin of pornography or uh, an addiction to alcohol or a different substance, or maybe it's lying or telling half-truths or or cutting corners consistently at work, or cheating on different people, or on different things, or maybe it's gossiping, maybe it's overeating or overspending. I don't know what it is for you, but our tendency is to kind of cake ourselves with the mud of this sin. And for periods of time, it can be uh, fun, it can be exciting, it can be numbing, it can feel normal. But these times can come in our lives where what is enjoyable becomes uncomfortable. And what is a source of pleasure becomes a source of displeasure, discontent, and anxiety. And if we were honest, all we want is to get clean. Maybe for you, it's not necessarily like an outright sin. Maybe there's just something at play in your life, like an insecurity. Maybe you're tired of just this addiction to comparing yourself to other people or always wanting to know if you're enough. Maybe there's an insecurity at play in your life. And it feels the same way. You want to break free from it. What you need is you need someone to help you figure out how to turn the shower on so that you can break free from it. I believe that every single person in this room this morning has something in your life that is not giving you life, it's stealing life from you. I believe that every single person here in some ways wants to get clean. And if that's you, I want you to join me this morning in Mark chapter one as we look at a story in the scriptures which is all about getting clean. It's all about turning on the shower in our lives. And as you turn there, let me just Uh, tell you this, if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, the goal of this message today and really the goal of this passage is to help what we have experienced positionally to be our experience practically. We want what is true of us positionally before Jesus to be true of us now practically with Jesus. Because the reality is this, if you've come to a place where you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then the shower of God's grace has already opened up and lavished you with his love, acceptance, forgiveness, and approval. That is what is true of you positionally. If you know Jesus Christ, you are forever clean before your God. What we're hoping this morning is that what is true of us positionally could now be true of us practically. We want, out, we want to put our position into practice. And we want to begin to walk in this life of being clean. Mark chapter 1, let me read you this short story, verses 40 through 45. It says this, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. So here's what I want to make sure you see. This is a story in which for this man with leprosy, getting clean is ultimate. This is a story about getting clean. For this man, it was a story about getting clean from leprosy. But what you need to know is in the scriptures, leprosy is often a symbol for our sin. 
And so that's why this story is going to be so helpful for us. The reason that God has put this story into the scriptures is because he wants us to be acquainted with him as cleanser and heal her. And I would just go so far as to say, you will not be able to know a deep, meaningful, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ without knowing him as cleanser and healer. You will have to become acquainted with him as one who can deal with the sin in your life. If you wanna get the shower on in your life, if you wanna take a step toward getting clean, what I wanna do this morning is I wanna look at this story and I wanna give you three keys to change. Three really active ingredients, three ingredients that will have to be active in your life if you wanna take a step towards change, and I promise you this, if these three things are active in your life, I promise you, you will see change. You will see movement. You will be able to take steps towards freedom. The first key ingredient to change is the ingredient of desperation. Desperation. When I talk about desperation, I'm talking about you coming to a place where you are desperate for Jesus to invade your life and to do something about what is going on. You want him to do something about that which is stealing life instead of actually giving it. So uh, let's just think about the man with leprosy because he modeled beautifully for us what desperation is. Uh, should look like. But let's just make sure that we're all on the same page about what leprosy really is. That word leprosy in the scriptures is a general term that refers to all types of different skin diseases, but uh, leprosy was considered one of the worst evils that could afflict someone. Without treatment in a hot climate, a skin diseases could be vicious and they could manifest themselves in boils, in scabs, and uh, along with uh, kind of the physical uh, ailments of leprosy could come a numbing sensation where you would begin to itch your skin and you wouldn't know that your skin is deteriorating and rotting. So it can be very, it can ravage your skin and it can cause deformity. And so uh, what we have is this picture of a body that is rotting away and deforming because of this disease. Rabbis spoke of lepers as the, the living dead, okay? We've got that TV show, uh, The Walking Dead. That's not an original series, okay? They just looked at Mark chapter one. They're like, that would make a great TV show, leprosy. These lepers were the real walking dead, all right? Uh, rabbis really looked at them and they said, man, that is a living death. And so leprosy would ravage a person physically, but not just that, it would devastate people socially and religiously. Let me just read you something from Leviticus, and you know this is special if I'm quoting Leviticus people. (laughs) But here's what it says in Leviticus 13, verses 45 and 46. It says, anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes, let their hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of their face and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. Do you see how devastating this would be religiously and socially? You'd have to wear torn clothes. Some of y'all are like, well, I've got holes in my jeans. No, that's being cool. This is different. You wear torn clothes. You, you have to leave your hair messed up. Some of y'all are looking at your high school kid like you're halfway there, bro. <laughs> but you'd have to walk around, you'd cover your mouth, and you would yell out, unclean, unclean. And you'd have to live alone. You'd have to live separate from everyone else. No one could come in contact with you. No one could get in breathing distance of you because there was the fear that if they were to breathe the same air that you're breathing, that they would potentially become contaminated and unclean. 
And then when you would go to the synagogue to worship, you would have to sit in your own special section where there was a partition that was blocking you from the rest of the people. So just imagine, what if we got our leprosy section at Faith Bridge for all the people walking in going, unclean, unclean. It's like, yeah, that's your section right over there. You can sit over there, separate from everyone else. This was the experience of this man. So the reason that I'm telling you this is that I just need you to get a picture of what's really taking place in this man's life. Leprosy was robbing this man of his health, his reputation, his occupation, his family, his friends, and his ability to worship freely. The hardest part, though, about leprosy is that there was no known cure. It was considered uncontrollable as this living death. So with all this in mind, what do we see the man doing? We see him coming to Jesus. Let's just be clear on what's happening. When he comes to Jesus, he's breaking the law. Right here, this man is breaking the law. And some would say that he's being um, self-centered and inconsiderate because by coming to Jesus, he's putting Jesus in jeopardy of being contaminated and being declared unclean. But this man comes anyway. Why? Because he is desperate for something to happen. He's desperate for change. He has reached the point in his life where he is saying, I cannot go another second being robbed. If this man can do something for me, I don't care what law I break, I'm willing to risk everything for the possibility of life and freedom. There's desperation. We see him, we see him coming before Jesus on his knees, begging him for change. And as I read this, I couldn't help but ask myself this question. Um, Am I really desperate for Jesus to make a change in my life? Like, do I want change? Like, is there mud caked on in my life that is uncomfortable? Yes. Would it be nice If there were certain things in my life that were no longer a part of it, yeah, absolutely. But am I desperate for Jesus to step in and make a change? I don't know if the answer to that question for me is yes. It was extremely convicting. Let me just ask you, are you desperate? Like really desperate for Jesus to make a change. Well, you say, well, I don't know if I'm desperate. How do you know? Like what what constitutes desperation? Well, let me just position it this way. When was the last time that you got on your knees and begged Jesus to make a change? Like actually got down on your knees and begged Jesus. Jesus to do something. How many days, how many weeks, how many months has it been since you've even asked him to step in? Because I think that we can just get going and we just let things that shouldn't be there just linger. So, How does desperation come about? You know how desperation comes? It comes by you reaching a point where you realize that you've gotten robbed long enough. It comes when you get to a point where you're like, enough! I'm so sick of being robbed! Enough of the feelings of helplessness, enough with the drama in my life, enough with the brokenness that's coming about in my relationships because of what I'm doing, enough with feeling like a spiritual loser, enough with everything that comes along with this mud in my life. It starts there. It starts with you realizing that you're getting robbed and you get to the point where you're sick of it. The other part 
of desperation is realizing that you can't do anything about it on your own. It's you coming to a place where you realize that your application of I'm just gonna try harder is bad application. What's your game plan? I'm just gonna try really hard. Good luck with that. We'll see you tomorrow. It's you coming to a place where you say, I can't do it on my own. I've tried that. I've tried the same thing over and over, which by the way, is the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. I've tried it, and it's not working. Jesus, I am desperate for you to step in and do something. The first key ingredient that has to be active in your life if you want to get clean is desperation. The second key ingredient is confidence. When I talk about confidence, I'm talking about a confidence in two things, a confidence in Jesus' ability to do something about your situation. The second thing I'm talking about is a confidence in Jesus' willingness to do something about your situation. It's a confidence in the ability and the willingness of Jesus to do something in your life. Here's what I want you to know about the leper in this story. Rabbi said that it, to heal leprosy was as difficult as raising the dead. That's how difficult it was for a leper to be made well. It was the equivalent of raising the dead, a.k.a. it's impossible. Getting cured of leprosy was considered impossible, yet we have this leper coming to Jesus, and what does he say? He says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. This guy was confident in Jesus' what? In his ability. He comes to Jesus, and he's saying, Jesus, with you, the impossible is possible. The unchangeable is changeable. He was confident in Jesus' ability, but what was this question about? His question was about the willingness of Jesus. Why? Well, because in the Old Testament, there was only two documented scenarios where God healed a leper. Only two. So this man comes, and he's like, well, this really isn't a question of can you This is a question of will you? I know you can, but do you want to? I just think about my own life, how this has played out, and I just want to open up a part of my story, which is a huge part of my story that I've shared with with thousands of people over the years. Um, But uh, between the summer before my freshman year in high school to the summer before my senior year in college, I dealt with a seven-year addiction to internet pornography. And uh, it, was, it was a struggle. It was a significant struggle in my life. And there were times where that struggle was going better than other times. But I lived in this continual, continuous cycle of, of promising God that I was done with it and I was going to get rid of it, and then I'd just screw up, and then I'd feel like a spiritual loser, and I just lived in this vicious cycle. And, uh, you know, when you let sin move into your life and make itself at home, like sin gets really comfortable, like they unpack boxes, like sin doesn't plan on moving out. Like, it wants to stay permanently. And when sin kind of moves in and makes itself at home, uh, you can begin to lose your confidence in a lot of things. Like, I lost my confidence in my ability to exhibit the fruit of self-control. I lost my, my confidence in my ability to really break free from this thing. And I think that the other thing that I lost confidence in, I lost confidence in Jesus' willingness to do something about my sin. I never lacked confidence in his ability. Why? Because, I mean, all you have to do is read the scriptures. He's got an impressive resume. Like, if he can speak the universe into being, he can probably deal with what's going on in my life. Like, he has an incredible resume. But uh, I think I just lost confidence in his, in his willingness. I, I, I think I just 
bought into the lie that God just was over it. It's like, man, I have heard you talk about this so many times. Timothy, you have promised me so many times that you're done with this, and I'm just over it. That's how I viewed God. There's a lack of confidence in his willingness. I don't know where you're at when it comes to the mud in your life, the stuff that you want to break free from. Where does your confidence seem to be lacking? Is it a lack of confidence in his ability or his willingness? Uh, I don't know what it is for you, but I want you to know that this scripture is in the, the Bible. This passage is in the Bible to bolster your confidence in both. So just you think about the story. Rather than turning from the leper like everyone else in the story, Jesus turned toward the leper to show that he was willing. He touched the man. He didn't have to, but he put his hand on the man to say, I will do what no one else will. I am willing. I'm the only one who's willing. And if his actions weren't loud enough, he just says, I am willing. Three words could possibly be the three most powerful words that you will hear this entire week. Even more powerful than I love you from your spouse. The God of the universe saying to you, I am willing. But then you look in the story and you see his ability. When he touched the man, instead of the leprosy making Jesus unclean, Jesus' holiness made the leper clean. And all Jesus had to do was say one word that we have translated into two words, be clean. And he was. This passage exists to fill up your tank with confidence. Now, if you look at this and still doubt, then all you need to do is look at the cross of Jesus Christ because the cross of Jesus Christ is the culmination of Jesus' ability and willingness. Jesus left heaven for earth. That's his willingness. He deserved to be worshipped as a king. Instead, he was crucified as a criminal for you and for me. That's his willingness. On the cross, he endured the wrath of God. All of our sin, all of our imperfection, all of our failure were taken upon his shoulders, and when he was nailed to the cross, so was your sin. Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross, and he endured the cross for you and for me. That's willingness. He died, he was put in a tomb, and on the third day he walked out of it. That's ability. All you have to do is look at the cross. I just want you to think, just imagine what could happen in your life if desperation and confidence began to work together. I just think about my own struggle as I was seeking to to break free from pornography, I began to wake up every single morning, every single morning. It was like I opened my eyes praying. I opened my eyes praying. And every single day, I would pray the same things. I would say, God, today, may your standard for purity become my standard for purity. God, would you fill me with your spirit today that I might begin to bear the fruit of self-control? God, when I am tempted today, would you help me see the way of escape and begin to take it? Because uh, the word of God, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, promises a way of escape, that God always provides a way of escape. Would you help me to see it and would you help me to take it? And then I just remind myself that I'm just one bad step away from failure. But what was I doing as I prayed? I was coming to him because I believed that he was willing to do something, but then I also knew that he was capable of doing something, that he could give me the, the fill, he could fill me with his spirit, he could point me towards a way of escape, that he could change my, my standards for purity, he could bring about change. Imagine what could happen in your own life if uh, desperation and confidence begin to work together. But I want you to know, it wasn't just desperation and confidence that allowed me to break free 
from the mud in my life, there was one more key ingredient, and it's the key ingredient of willingness. Willingness. Now, when I say willingness, I need you to know I'm not talking about God's willingness. I'm talking about your willingness. We've already talked about God's willingness. Jesus has been clear with us, I am willing. So if there's any question about if Jesus is willing, he just says, let me be clear. I'll just put it in a book that will last for forever. I am willing. Clear. The question is, are you willing? See, I think it's important uh, for us to just ask the question, what if the greatest roadblock to breaking free and getting clean in our lives, what if the greatest roadblock is our willingness to make a change. I also think it's important for us to look at this story and just acknowledge the fact that this story is a lot more about the who than the how. This story is a lot more about who can make you clean. It's not as much about how he will make you clean. I want you to know there are times in life where Jesus heals and cleanses like he did in this story. And you have these amazing testimonies where people are like, you know what? One day I was doing all this and it was crazy and I should have been dead like 10 times and then I met Jesus on that day and I have never been the same since and my life has seen a radical change. That happens sometimes, and those are incredible stories, but those aren't the norm. Amen. And so let's just be clear, this story is about the who. There is one who can make you clean, but he might not do it as he did it in this story. More often than not, and, and I don't wanna say more often than not because I can't see everything that God's doing in the world. I'll just say in my own personal experience, it's been more of a process than it has been an event. It's been a process, it's, it's been a journey of healing. And so it's not just about me coming to Jesus on one moment on my knees and saying, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And he's like, okay, be clean. And it's like, man, I'm glad I prayed that one prayer at church that one time. Man, I sure am glad that I went to that youth camp because I prayed that one time and man, it worked and that was awesome. No, it's actually a daily getting on your knees. It's daily desperation. It's daily confidence. And now it's daily willingness. The question is, are you willing because getting clean will cost you something. It will. So let me just ask you, are you willing to make it a priority to get on your knees daily and beg God? Are you willing to schedule it and say, I will get on my knees and beg God for healing? Are you willing to be fully known? Like, are you willing to step out of isolation into intimate, deep, connected relationships where you're fully known, where you let people see the tape of your sin. Like you push play and they get to see what is really going on in your life. They don't let you get by with ambiguous statements like, man, I'm really struggling right now. What does that mean? They will press in on you and they will care for you. Here's why I'm asking this. Often God displays his power through his people. And so are you willing to, to be known? Are you willing to take time to read the scriptures and meditate on them every day and memorize them so that your mind is filled with more truth than lies? Just think about Jesus when he was tempted in the desert. How did he combat the evil one? He quoted scripture. How about this one? Are you willing to get extreme with your sin even if it means getting uncomfortable or inconvenienced? Like, are you willing to be inconvenienced for the sake of freedom? Like, when I was breaking free in my struggle with pornography, I just got rid of all internet capability. And so if I needed to use the internet, I had to go to a public place to use it. And it was so inconvenient. And it was so worth it. 
I think about when uh, my wife and I were dating. We just didn't trust ourselves to be alone. So you know what we did is we would go to Barnes and Noble to watch a show together. Like when we got married, we, had no, we could not remember the feeling of sitting on a couch and watching a movie together. So we'd go to Barnes and Noble, we'd have a headphone splitter and she would have her earbuds and I'd put mine in and we'd be like, this is good, right? This is incredibly awkward. We're just watching a show with a bunch of strangers, but worth it is un- inconvenient. And I'm so glad we did it. Are you willing to be inconvenienced? Are you willing to change your playmates and playgrounds if you're playing with the wrong people in the wrong places? I remember one of my friends just saying, uh, you know, he was needing to break free from drugs and alcohol. And he said, I reached a moment where I looked at my friend who was a person that he would enjoy these things with. And he said, getting out of a car, he looked at him and said, if you want to get drunk or you want to get high, don't call me. And he closed the door and their relationship has never been the same. Are you willing to take the form in your chair and fill it out and give us an indication that you'd be interested in taking a step further with the church, whether it's into some type of recovery ministry that this this group that this church could offer you or even some one-on-one meetings? Are you willing to go to counseling? Are you willing? You know, uh, I don't mean to just focus on the struggle that I, I went through, but because I've been open about my struggle, it's given me an opportunity to speak to others about the same struggle. And I, I work with college students, and so a lot of times college guys hear my story and they want to meet to talk about their struggle with uh, pornography. And so we'll get together and we'll sit down, and I start... I begin to tell them about the different steps that I had to go through in order to break free. And as I'm talking, they begin to lose focus and lose eye contact, and they begin to look at the sky. And in that moment, I realize, oh, you're not willing yet. That's the problem. The problem is you're not willing. You were hoping that I'd just give you a silver bullet, this one thing that would just drop this thing in your life today. No, I don't have that for you. It's a process. However long it took you to get into this, it might take you that long to get out. I don't know. God can do amazing things. But you're not willing yet. I think about a friend who was in school with me in college who was very close to my situation and my struggle, and he was struggling with the same thing. And he saw the extreme measures I was going through, and he continued to wrestle with pornography for 10 more years. And he didn't break free until his 30s. Why? He wanted to baby step out of it. He wasn't willing. Are you willing? Desperation, confidence, willingness. I'll end by just reminding you of how this story ends. I think about uh, the leper. And what happens after Jesus heals him? Jesus looks at him and says, okay, now tell no one. And what does he do? The exact opposite. And I look at that and I'm like, I can't really teach that because I don't want to tell people like, go therefore and disobey Jesus. Like, that's not like this guy's best moment. And at the same time, you know what I really love about it? Is that he couldn't help but tell people about what Jesus had done for him because he had a story to tell. You know why I stand up here today and I actually talk about the struggle that I had with pornography because I don't have a story to hide. I have a story to tell. I have a story to tell because of what Jesus Christ has done in my life. I have been sober from internet pornography for 15 years now because of Jesus' work in my life and his kindness and his goodness to lead me towards freedom through desperation in confidence, in willingness. Would you believe today, no matter where you are, what you've been in, if you feel hopeless, would you believe that there's hope? If you believe that whatever is in your life is impossible, would you believe that today with Jesus 
It's possible. Would you believe that the unchangeable in your life is unchangeable? Would you believe today that you don't have to go through life like those people at the Dead Sea where you're looking around like thinking it would nice, it would be nice to be able to get clean, but that's not a possibility for me today. Would you believe that today the impossible is possible? Why? Because our God, Jesus Christ, is here with us this morning just uttering three words to us, I am willing. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for who you are, and I thank you for what you've done. And I thank you that with you, the impossible is always possible. The unchangeable is always changeable, Lord Jesus. I thank you for who you are and what you're able to do. And I thank you that you're here with us now just declaring that you, you are willing. I thank you for the story of the leper. I thank you that that, Lori, that leper's story is all of our stories, that every single one of us, has sin in our lives. And just as that leper was separated from society, we have been separated from you. Just as that leper could do nothing to get rid of his leprosy, there's nothing we can do in our own effort to get rid of our sin. But you, Jesus Christ, have left heaven and come to earth. And you have displayed your ability and your willingness through the cross. Thank you that through faith in Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of our sins, positionally we can be made clean forever before God. But I thank you that you love us enough to not just let us sit in that positional theory, but that we can move toward the practicality of this truth that you came and you conquered sin and death on our behalf. And so, Lord, I pray for my friends in here today that we are all people who want to get clean. And I thank you that you're willing. Amen. Friends, we're going to respond in this moment right now. And this is just going to be a moment for those who want to take a step towards getting clean to take that step. And uh, I'm going to be down front on uh, the Right side of the stage, Ken's going to be on the other side. We're going to have prayer partners as well. And maybe that's your first step. If you just want to take a step toward being known, then we'd love to talk to you. We'd love to pray with you and just be a breath of hope into your life by praying for you. And if maybe this is just a moment as the band leads for you to just sit and be still and do business with the Lord, but let's not move past this message. Let's not move past these three words Jesus saying to us, I am willing. Let's do business with them now. And let's take a step towards freedom. Let's take a step toward getting clean. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for who you are and what you're doing in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello and welcome to Postscript. I'm Kyle Pettit, young adult pastor here at FaithBridge, and I'm sitting here with Timothy Atik, who just preached a sermon called I Am Willing. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, message, but we do have a couple questions uh, that we're just going to dive into immediately. The first one says, uh, what does it mean when in verse 41 it says that Jesus was indignant? Great. Well, um, <clears throat> good interpretive question of the text. Uh, commentators actually go two different directions on this. It's, it's debated what is actually meant. So, if you look in the NIV, which is what I was reading from today, it says indignant. But if you look in other translations, it says that he was moved with compassion. Okay, so um, the, the word carries the idea of being moved in your bowels. Okay, so 
it, it honestly could be interpreted either way. It could be compassion. It could be anger, mm. indignation. And uh, I choose not to take one or the other. I, I can reconcile both because I think that in when, when Jesus was confronted with the leper, I think that he felt anger towards the brokenness that sin has upon the world, that that leprosy was just another reminder that this world is not as it should be, okay? So when, when it talks about that indignation, I think that that, that is, right. if he was angry, it's that he's angry at the impact of sin being in this world, the, the impact he was seeing before his eyes. Right. We see the compassion. He was moved with compassion to, to heal the man. Okay, so I think that both of those interpretations work. But just know that if you go and read a bunch of commentaries, which is what I did, which is what I did, people people go both ways with it, and they have good explanations for both. Right, and that kind of that idea that if you're angry at the sin, that's a form of compassion in a way because you want love to come in there so badly. Sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's awesome. Um, well, another question we have is, uh, why would Jesus tell the leper to not go and tell anyone? Yeah, I, I think that that's a that's a good question. I think what we have to un what we have to remember is that the reason that Christ came to Earth was to to fulfill the will of the Father, mm -hmm. and ultimately the will of the Father was to crush His Son. So Jesus was on a trajectory which would land him at the cross, right. okay? And so for, for this guy to go and tell, the response will be people just coming to see him perform miracles. Jesus didn't want to just be known as a miracle worker. He was actually on this earth fulfilling a very specific um, mission. Right. And by this guy going and telling would actually complicate the mission, and we don't know all the ways that it would complicate it, but we know that it complicated it because Jesus had to withdraw from that place to lonely places instead of being able to freely move about the city. And we we get glimpses of that in different parts of the gospel where, you know, the crowd is pressing in on him so much that he has to get on a boat and teach from the boat. You know, he feeds 5,000, and what do they want to do? They want to take him and make him king. All of these stand in opposition to his ultimate goal, which is to be crucified on a cross for the sins of the world. And so, you know, when people hear about miracles, what they want to do is they want to come and elevate the person. Jesus wasn't in a position where he wanted to be worshipped as a king, even though that's what he deserved. He wanted to come and fulfill his mission, which is to give his life as a ransom for many. And so, you know, yeah, I one more thing, and I, you know, I think about John chapter two, when they run out of wine, and his mom looks at him and says, mm -hmm. "Do something." He's like, "Hey, my time hasn't come." Yeah. Time was very important to Jesus, right. that he says, "My time isn't right now." Mm -hmm. That, you know, there was a time that was mm -hmm. coming, where he's going to say, "It is finished," yeah. basically saying, "Okay, the time is now when everything is complete." So. He, he was basically saying, now's not the time to go and tell everyone because that's actually going to impact the way that I, yeah. things are lined out for me to accomplish them. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. That idea to like, at the end of everything, it's Jesus came to die on the cross. Yeah. Like the, the miracles along the way, it shows his character, it shows who he is, but yeah. his ultimate goal was to die for yeah. us. Um, cool. Well, we have one more uh, question. Um, and it says, my question is that when you make these positive changes in your lives and you overcome addictions such as the porn, the porn addiction that you shared, um, how do you forgive yourself and move past the shame and guilt that you were once struggling with? And she goes on to say, or he goes on to say, um, I have a hard time getting over the shame and the guilt of bad decisions and mistakes I made 15 years ago, even though I know God has extended grace and forgiveness to me, I struggle forgiving myself. Man, that, it's a, that is a real thing yeah. that I've dealt with in my own life. And I think for me, the, the, the place where I've landed is if you look at Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, it, it talks about the fact that Jesus has forgiven all of our sins, that he has taken them, he has canceled the record of our sin, mm -hmm. having nailed it to the cross, that 
you know, you think about a record. It's, it's not an individual sin. It's the entire record of your sins. Every sin that you have or would commit, Jesus took. It says he has carried it away. He's removed it when he nailed it to the cross. So when, for me, it's realizing when God looks at me, he no longer is looking at that record, which includes those failures. He's seeing Jesus and what he's done for me. So, you know, for me, what I had to really deal with is if, if, if Christ has forgiven me, mm-hmm. for me to not forgive myself is actually diminishing Christ's work on the cross because Jesus Christ came and he died and endured wrath to set me free. Okay. That was his goal was to set me free. He came to bring freedom into my life. And so he did all of that so I could be free. And when I won't forgive myself, that is hindering me from the freedom that he came to purchase for me. And so it just, I, as the more I thought about it, like if God can forgive me, but I can't forgive myself, Mm -hmm. there's a disconnect there. And I'm actually diminishing Christ's work on the cross. So I would say that for me personally, in my own journey through life, what I've had to remember is that, um, the, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It doesn't say you will feel the truth and the truth will set you free. It says you will know the truth that you have to learn that your feelings can't lead your thoughts. Your thoughts have to lead your feelings. Okay. So I would have to tell myself, I've already forgiven myself of that. If God has forgiven me, Mm -hmm. I have to forgive myself to hold that against myself is, is actually diminishing Christ's work in my life. So I choose to forgive myself. And, and you do that enough and your feelings begin to follow the fact your feelings don't determine what is fact. Does that make sense? Yes. It's a process. It's a daily process of saying, I've already forgiven myself. I don't even have the right to feel guilt and shame over that because Jesus already took it away. Jesus already said, I got rid of your record, but we want to say, yeah, but what about my record? He's like, I already got rid of it. Mm-hmm. It's already gone. And so it's that knowing the truth and letting that truth set you free. That's so good. I know I've had similar experiences in that of like having to speak this truth over. That's like right. I don't feel it but I know it's true, like you said, like yeah. we know the truth and that's what yeah. sets us free. Yeah, and having people who can come around you yeah. and reaffirm the truth in your life. You need truth tellers in your life. You need to know the truth and you need people who can affirm that truth right. in your life. Awesome. Well, T.A., thank you uh, for a, a fantastic message. Uh, thanks for, for answering these questions. Uh, and thank you for joining us at Postscript. We'll see you back next Sunday as we start our new series, Shareable. Uh, we'll see you then. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.